Coming up. We have not stopped emitting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Like a coordinated climate attack, heavy rains and floods hit Japan. Turkey. Spain. China. Russia. And the US. It was very horrible, actually, and making it home was terrifying. Scores of people are killed in India alone. Malaria is reported in America for the first time in 20 years. Scientists warn the disease could re-emerge as mosquitoes breed and thrive in warmer weather. The ext extreme weather that we're seeing these days due to climate change is actually benefiting mosquitoes. But first, very, very hot. People in Spain struggle to keep cool in grueling heat as they swelter through a fourth consecutive day of exceptional global average temperatures. We're actually only just at the beginning of that process. This is just two degrees on TRT World. The abnormally high temperatures the group experienced in June, and then for four consecutive days in July, sure bears the fingerprint of the planetary crisis. From an average global temperature that reached 17.01 degrees Celsius on July 7th to 17.24 degrees on July 11th, record-breaking temperatures have been hitting us fast and furious. And the El Nino weather pattern, scientists say, has added to the abnormally high ocean temperatures we saw too. It was hard to escape the heat in places like the US states of Arizona and Texas and China. When you're doing El Nino year, you get higher temperatures in the atmosphere as well because heat is moving from the oceans to the atmosphere. But as you correctly pointed out, we're actually only just at the beginning of that process. So El Nino hasn't had as much of an effect as it's going to later in the year. So we're seeing these high temperatures in you know, the North Atlantic, etc., despite the fact that El Nino hasn't really got going yet. You know, we can expect much higher temperatures from the El Nino in you know, the latter half of the year in sort of October, November time. And along with the heat, in some places came particularly heavy rains and destructive flooding. Sarah takes a look at these global storms. July rains have brought a deluge worldwide. New York's Hudson Valley and Vermont saw some of the worst flooding since Hurricane Irene in 2011, thanks to a slow-moving storm over the region. Once again, the skies opened up and wrought so much rain nine inches of rain in this community, that they're calling this a 1,000-year event. The deadly torrents flooded homes, washed out roads and bridges, cut off access to towns, forced evacuations, rescues, and prompted authorities to call a state of emergency in the northeastern United States. At the time of the report, at least two had been killed. China's Hubei province and Chongqing municipality were also flooded by heavy rains that swelled the Yangtze River and triggered landslides and road damage. The threat prompted authorities to relocate citizens and likewise activate an emergency flood response. In Japan, torrential rains slammed the southwestern region, causing mudslides and floods that have damaged homes and infrastructure, leaving several dead or missing. In Turkey, the Disaster and Emergency Management Presidency declared red alerts to more than a dozen provinces across the country due to heavy downpours. Rivers overflowed, and the rains caused what authorities estimate at nearly a thousand landslides in the region. Flooding damaged homes and took at least one life in the city of Samsun. In India, heavy monsoon rains broke records for July in New Delhi, closing schools. Rain over the region also caused landslides and flash floods that killed dozens across northern states. The Bias River, north of the capital, burst its banks, and authorities warned Himalayan state residents not to leave their homes. Despite being far apart, climate experts say these floods are connected, the result of a global climate change phenomenon. Unfortunately, uh, we are on a path to more global warming, right? We have not stopped emitting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, as long as we do so, the planet will continue to warm. As it warms, we will have more water vapor in the atmosphere. As we have more water vapor in the atmosphere, we will have more intense rainfall. Sarah Balter, Just Two Degrees.
On the show now to talk about this, uh, these global floods, is Rajiv Kumar Chaturvedi. He's Professor of Ecology and Climate Change at the Birla Institute of Technology and of Science in Palani, India. Hi there, Professor. So it's always good seeing you. Uh, first, we, please let us extend our condolences to the families of those who've lost uh, loved ones. Um, what do you make of all these storms? Our production team were just speaking about trying to remember a time when so many storms hit the globe seemingly at the same time. What do you make of it all? Yeah, so we have to remember that uh, the world has already won by 1.1 degrees centigrade. And as uh, the world has won by 1.1 degrees centigrade, so this, all these storms and the extreme rainfall events are happening in this warmer world. Uh, it is a common knowledge that as temperatures rise by one degree centigrade, the moisture holding capacity of the atmosphere rises by around seven percentage. So the matter of the fact is that we have more moisture in the atmosphere. So this more moisture means uh, more rain, and uh, many a times uh, it happens in bursts and uh, uh, takes the form of extreme rainfall events. What is happening now has uh, IPCC and the climate experts have been talking about in this kind of a scenario for a very long time now. And uh, But the problem is that the world has warmed by 1.1 degrees centigrade so far, and uh, this is what we are witnessing. We are witnessing. And uh, so uh, the problem is that as the world warms by uh, beyond two degrees or so, then these problems are going to go uh, much higher. So probably we should worry about that kind of a scenario. And it is really very important for the humanity to act uh, at, right at this point of time when we have some time left. Uh, uh, as the window of opportunity, the window of uh, opportunity for mitigating the climate risk below 1.5 or even 2 degrees centigrade is fast closing. So before that opportunity closes, we must um, be vigilant and we must uh, come together and uh, try to resolve, um, like mitigate climate change to safer levels. Uh, India, of course, was not spared from these uh, heavy rainfall and storms and floods in July. Um, how are people coping? We know thousands of people lost their homes. Where are they staying? How is the government taking care of them? Uh, yes. Uh, like whenever this kind of a tragedy happens anywhere, uh, so people, especially the poor and the vulnerable people, uh, they... Uh, lose their uh, homes, and they have to spend time uh, in miserable conditions. So um, it is universal, even in India also, a lot of people are, uh, have, like some people have lost their lives. We have, uh, like we extend our condolences to them. And at the same time, many people are at, even, even still at risk, and uh, a lot of people have become homeless. So the government is taking care of them, trying to take care of them, NGOs, civil society, everybody is putting their best effort, and let's hope that we are able to help these uh, people. Professor Chaturferi, always good speaking to you. Thank you. Well, one of the negative consequences of floods is mosquitoes. They thrive near stagnant water where they lay their eggs. The Anopheles, which is one of thousands of species of mosquito, has the nasty habit of spreading malaria, sometimes fatal disease, to the humans they bite. Well, the U.S. has issued a health alert after five cases of malaria were registered in Florida and Texas. Authorities say the risk of contracting the disease in the U.S. remains relatively low, but people are afraid mosquito-borne diseases could become more common as the insects thrive in warm weather. It's one of the biggest killers of children in the world, claiming the life of one child every minute. Majority of them are babies in sub-Saharan Africa. The World Health Organization says at least 247 million cases and more than 600,000 deaths were registered in 2022. With the climate crisis, changing weather patterns, mosquitoes that carry this disease are increasing in density and spreading further afield. Malaria remains one of Africa's deadliest diseases killing nearly half a million children under the age of five 
every year. Malaria is mostly spread through bites from infected female Anopheles mosquitoes. They bite people and animals, usually late in the evening or at night. They have four stages in their life cycle. After sucking blood from their host, they rest for a few days while the blood digests and the eggs develop. The eggs are laid directly on water. Most eggs hatch into larvae within 48 hours. And in eight to 10 days, they mutate into pupa and then to an adult mosquito after two to three days. Blood transfusions and contaminated needles may also transmit malaria. The most common early symptoms are fever, headache, and chills. These may be mild for those who have had the infection before. Children, pregnant women, and people with suppressed immunity are at a higher risk of severe illness and death. So uncomplicated malaria is not extremely dangerous. A person gets a fever, they can get headache, they can have vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, they can have whole body aches. Um, so it feels like a really bad flu. However, some people go on to develop complications so they can have seizures, they can go into a coma, their liver and their kidneys could fail. Um, and malaria can be fatal um, in severe cases. So um, the, initial, the initial symptoms are not severe, but then um, untreated, malaria is an emergency disease. Hope is on the horizon with a new vaccine, R21. It's still under review at the World Health Organization and final results from late stage trials have not yet been published. However, Ghana became the first country to approve its use, followed by Nigeria. In the case of malaria, um, a, mosquito, a mosquito bites you uh, and injects um, a parasite form called sporozoites into your skin. And those sporozoites then move through the lymph and the blood circulatory system. Uh, and eventually adds up in the river. So the vaccine that we are talking about today, R21 Matrix M vaccine, uh, interferes with the sporozoites, uh, stopping them from uh, invading the river cells. Malaria was first discovered at a military hospital in Algeria in 1880. Since then, efforts to eradicate it have fell short. Dominic Brian Omondi, just two degrees. Here to talk to us from the Netherlands about the spread of this disease in different parts of the world is Bart Knowles, who's Managing Director of the Science and Conservation Centre in the Maldives. Uh, Mr Knowles, appreciate your time. Um, I can tell you, because I, I'm from the Caribbean, that you always avoid mosquitoes because not only do they spread malaria, but yellow fever, dengue fever as well. Um, are you hearing of malaria cases in Texas and um, Florida, is that concern to you? Should we be we, we worried about it? Actually, as you were just mentioning, the, the ext extreme weather that we're seeing these days due to climate change is actually benefiting mosquitoes. I mean, higher temperatures mean that mosquitoes thrive better. Higher humidities means that they survive better. They produce more offspring, so mosquito populations become bigger over time. And therefore, the risk that a mosquito will be successful in transmitting a parasite from one person when it bites to another person when it bites next is simply increasing. Now, in the case of the United States and Florida and Texas, where we had these five cases, this is not something that is entirely new. I mean, every year there's more than a thousand people that carry parasites with them from their holiday destination back to the United States. Mm. And since mosquitoes are still flying around, malaria mosquitoes are flying around in the US, it could be that a an, an U.S. malaria mosquito bites a person that brought a parasite from a faraway destination and then succeeds in locally transmitting that parasite. And that's something that we've seen since the since decades. And since the 1992, we've had more than 11 of these outbreaks. And this is just the latest one. If mosquitoes, including the Anopheles, thrives in warmer weather and the group is warming up, what do you think that means for their spread throughout places where they normally would not inhabit? Well, there's, there's two things that are actually happening. First of all, we see that mosquitoes can survive and transmit malaria at higher altitude. So in, in previous times, when the higher places 
in sub-Saharan Africa were practically free of malaria, we now see that malaria is creeping up the slopes of these mountains to higher altitudes and people fall sick there because they've not been exposed to malaria before. So that's one. Two is that the season, the length, the duration of the season over a year is expanding. So whereas normally you would have a dry season and a wet season, and only during the wet season there would be a lot of transmission of malaria, that wet season is now expanding in many areas, which means that we're going to see more cases uh, cumulative over time than we would have in, in, uh, in years where we would not have extreme weather. You know, people laugh at me here in Istanbul. Whenever they see me see a mosquito, I go absolutely berserk. I stop at nothing to get it killed. It tells me that people here don't have that information when it comes to mosquitoes and the threat they pose. What should people know in terms of preventing bites? Well, I mean, the, the, the first thing to mention here is the important thing, and that is that due to climate change, these vector-borne, these mosquito-borne diseases are expanding their territories into southern Europe and moving further northwards. Mm. And that is simply um, as a fact of transportation of goods, transportation of mosquitoes that are accidentally being uh, transported over larger areas, and people picking up pathogens wherever they travel in the world and bringing these back home. And that means that we have diseases like chikungunya, like dengue virus, we have uh, uh, Zika virus, we have all these diseases sort of popping up, and that means that we have to inform the public that they should be aware that these kind of diseases will now be circulating in Southern Europe and further north in future. And that means people have to protect themselves by using, for instance, a bat net to sleep under, if we're mm -hmm. talking about malaria. Or they have to use repellents on their skin to protect themselves during the day, as we're talking about the mosquitoes that transmit this dengue or chikungunya virus. So the times are changing. Mm -hmm. And it's really important because of climate change that we have to take note of the changes that we see in these diseases that are being carried by mosquitoes. Well, Mr. Knowles, very informative. Thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Well, here's some sports news. Well, not really. While thousands of people looked down at some of the most dynamic and high-seeded tennis players in Wimbledon, there was another challenge unfolding outside. Activists from the group Plastics Rebellion were stopped by police as they staged a protest against how plastics were being used and discarded at the venue. More specifically, plastics in bottles provided by the French water company Evian. Just yes. so you're aware. Yes, yes. Um, I understand, obviously, from my colleagues earlier, were you um, just having that leaflets regarding plastics? Yes, that's we have correct? talked to a lot of people in the queue. We are naive. Oh, OK. Uh, like uh, Evian, yeah. Yeah. which yeah, is yeah. our biggest uh, plastic polluter in, the, uh, in Europe, one of the, one of the biggest ones. Uh, we make two billion plastic bottles a year, so we're talking to some of the, the people in the crowd, yeah. doing some antics, and this is very exciting. We're going to really enjoy this. We have found the plastic mountain. Oh, and because uh, naive, we built the plastic mountains. That's what our logo oh, right. is, uh, plastic okay. mountains. Uh -huh. And voila, uh, they are right here, the plastic yeah. mountains. Yeah. Okay. We're extremely excited. We're going to continue our talking to people, and that's our main plan. Yeah, you know, we've got some no issues with that. It's well. our trail. Obviously, obviously, we just try and facilitate everything, more, more or less. So, obviously, we want to make sure you guys are okay. We want to make sure, obviously, there's going to be no disruption to the events that are happening today. And, um, and, and just try and engage with you and see how we can, obviously, obviously identify any concerns you have and see and tell you our yes. concerns as well. Well, so we have a big concern because it is a very so. large amount of uh, people trying to install reuse in yep. this site. They're putting taps in the Wimbledon. Yep. These taps, they, uh, water comes straight from them. No need for plastic. Right, Unfortunately, it's very bad for our business plan. So mm -hmm. it's one of the things that we're trying to uh, raise awareness of. Yep. We want to sell the plastic to build the plastic mountains. <laughs> do you do this quite a lot? Do you come out? And if you've heard a French accent in there, you won't be mistaken. Plastics Rebellion is known for their spoofs of fossil fuel companies. We caught up with the group outside the Wimbledon gates. Okay, hi Janet, it's good seeing you. You are outside of Wimbledon. What is happening there? We are highlighting the appalling greenwashing going on inside by Evian with the um, uh, ridiculous refill machine that they're giving to players on court. Uh, give us a bit more detail in terms of what Plastics Rebellion is unhappy with when it comes to how Wimbledon has run this year. Yeah, so Plastics Rebellion, we are dedicated to ending the scourge of pointless plastics 
uh, globally and uh, Evian are very conspicuous sponsors of Wimbledon tennis. They have been for over a decade now and uh, they sell, oh, they produce, sorry, two billion plastic bottles a year. Um, so they're, they're hugely conspicuous here. If you walk around this area, you'll see lots of discarded Evian uh, water bottles. Um, and obviously Danone, who are the parent company of Evian, uh, are one of the top global plastic polluters. Are there any uh, plastics recyclable bins around to dump those plastic bottles? There are none outside here on the streets where we are. I believe there are some recycling uh, machines inside, uh, or, or we're not entirely sure what they look like, but they're heavily uh, covered in the Evian livery. Yeah, and they're also providing aluminium cans as an exclusive offer to people in inside. Do you know much about how Wimbledon is treating um, this year's events? Is there a climate friendly um, uh, way that they're running things this year? They're definitely waking up to the fact that they need to flout their sustainable credentials, as are all huge sporting events. Um, I'm sure you know that all main sporting events this summer have been uh, targeted by climate campaigners. Um, so they're very keen to show off their sustainable credentials. But uh, as to whether those are really happening, that's another question. Janet, have you guys, or Plastics Rebellion as a group, have you got no response from, from Dan on? We have had no response yet. We've been copying them into our social media. It would be great to hear from them because they produce 750,000 tonnes of plastic a year. They're being sued at the moment by Client Earth, Surf Rider and Zero Waste France because they have failed to provide adequate plans to deplastify as one of the top global plastics polluters. And before I let you go, Janet, um, have, how, how is Wimbledon, the uh, location, treating you guys as a climate group? Have you been able to enter? Have they prevented you from entering? They definitely have, yeah. Yesterday, uh, well, and today, we've been followed by several police on bicycles who have uh, <laughs> obviously been really uneasy at our presence. Um, but uh, we're not disrupted. We use satire and humour to... To, uh, you know, highlight the absurdities of the system and to ask people to deplastify. So uh, they needn't be quite as worried as they are, but there's a, there's, there's a few around um, watching us wherever we go, yeah. Uh, considering, uh, Janet, considering the UK's 2023 Public Order Act, are you nervous protesting? Always, always. They, they change the goalposts all the time. So um, everything's tightening up. Uh, we have to maintain uh, some way of protesting because things are tightening up. Yeah, no, it's a real worry. And here's the Plastics Rebellion spoof at Wimbledon that quickly went viral. Janet, what are you doing? Uh, I am making a, I am making a plastic mountain. Yes, the plastic mountain, because we are naive and that is our business model. We are building the plastic mountain. We're not a water company, are we? Because we are not a water company. A waterfall out of the sky for free. Uh, you know, no, we are a plastic company and, and you know, it's very hard to make yeah. uh, plastic, yeah, you know. It's got beautiful bottles, you know, it's a petrochemical product from oil and gas. It takes a lot of energy to make and we can't really get rid of it. We can only put it in a recycling loop or chuck it into the ground. We are a plastic company making two billion bottles a year. Two billion? Two billion and we're going to make more and more and more! more!
But there was no spoofing the corporate world in Uganda. At least four climate activists there were arrested and detained as they voiced opposition to the controversial East Africa oil pipeline. The project includes crude oil extraction in Uganda and more than 1,400 pipes to, to the Tanzanian coastline. It's faced major resistance from local communities and environmentalists. They say it poses environmental and social risks to natural habitats. The French petroleum company Total Energy and China's national offshore oil are the main foreign investors involved. And that's it from this episode of Just Two Degrees. Before we go, take a look at this. Near Canada's Alberta province, a tornado struck. The twister wrecked homes and killed livestock. It caused no serious injury to human lives. Until next time, bye.